Can you guys hear me? I have like two mics on. Can you guys hear me? All right. Wonderful. Well, good morning, church. Looking radiant over there. Good morning. Good to see everybody. And thank you so much for the opportunity to share the word uh, with you this morning. I'm so excited. Um, we do not take your presence here for granted. Uh, for all the workers who are here, can you guys hear me? All right. Sorry about that. For all the workers who are here every morning, brazing the morning fog to come here and break down to set up, we really, really appreciate you. You are a working miracle. Thank you. Give yourself a round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, I was reading an article a while back, and it said that millennials and Gen Z are leaving the church, and evangelism is going on the decline. But I look around us, and I look at all these Gen Zers and millennials here every Sunday, and I just want to say the lie is out there, but we are in here in the church paving the way for the Lord. So thank you again. Before I get started, I want to thank Banke and Lynn for the KC Missions team. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Um, I had the unique opportunity to volunteer with the Fresh Team. The Fresh Team uh, is an organization that served in the uh, Houston area in the homeless community. And this past Monday, we were able to serve food and water to the homeless community in the city of Houston. So please give them a round of applause. And even you, thank you for your time, your generosity, the money that you give. It's all to help people in our city. And we truly, truly appreciate it. You know, sometimes when we volunteer and we, you know, go ahead and serve the homeless people, there's a tendency to think that you're doing somebody a favor. But in my experience and what I've experienced in my short time just volunteering here and even in the past, what I've seen is that you leave that place a different person, that the encounter you have with these people changes you for a lifetime. When I first got there on Monday, um, there was this guy that was in a wheelchair Banke and Solomon, they were praying with him. And this, this man is a bilateral amputee, so he doesn't have his leg below the knee. And he was just talking to us, and we're praying with him, but he didn't want us to go, and he kept praying with us, and he kept talking, and he kept holding us back, and he didn't want us to go. And I'm like, I don't know what this guy is doing. You know, he's an amputee. In my head, I'm thinking, does he have diabetes? Is he coherent? I'm diagnosing his disease. But then, like, I just was, I was making excuses for myself, for not why I wasn't paying any attention to what he was saying. And Solomon's system that was very, very, very interesting to me. Um, I deal with a lot of skepticism, and I think God is still working on me on that. Um, with my scientific mind, if I cannot see, if I cannot touch, it's very hard for me to really believe. And I, I would say that my walk to being a Christian and just growing and giving my life to Christ, it takes a leap of faith. And you can't feel that kind of stuff. You can't touch that kind of stuff. And I think for this man, when I look at him and Solomon telling me, you know, that man really touched me. He really said something that changed me. He really inspired me. And I, I was like, really? Okay, sure. It just, yeah, sure. You know, I was unconsciously judging him, thinking that he can't be capable of doing that. But then... As I was listening to him, as, as we started the fresh um, ability to just kind of go ahead and start serving people, uh, the team hooks up a mic and they put music on the middle of the city and music is just blasting in Houston, just, just in the center of the city. You have this homeless guy just jumping and rejoicing and you have this bilateral amputee guy. He gets up with his two stumps on his wheelchair and he puts his hand up in the air, his hands raised up and he was just crying and he was just sinking to the Lord. And I thought to myself, how is it that this man who I thought was not coherent, this man that I was unconsciously judging, this man has his hands up carefree, his other friends jumping and just carefree singing to the Lord. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, maybe I'm, I'm the one with the problem. Maybe we are the one with a spiritual mental illness. Maybe this man, you know, you might have a problem, but a lot of us, we have a problem too. It's hard for us to just lift our hands up in humble abandon to Jesus and say, God, take it all. It's very difficult for us. But look around. Look around us. We all have our priorities upside down. We're chasing after money, after power, after fame, after likes, after followers, after all of these things that would never chase us back without a cost. We're grasping onto things and to people that will eventually leave us or us leave them. How many of us here have a fridge full of food, closets full of clothes, 
a warm bed and a working air conditioned room and we still feel empty, broken, and alone. How many of us can throw our hands up to Jesus and just lean on him for our safety and security? I know I still struggle with it. I'm sure a lot of you here still struggle with that too. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the Lent season, about the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus, and why that is important to us. In our text, let me get back to the real text today. In our text, we see the synagogue leader approach Jesus, and he went down on his knees, asking Jesus to please heal his daughter. In this version, it tells you that uh, he comes because his daughter is about to die or is dead. But in other versions, in Mark and in Luke, it actually says that the child is dying, so she's not dead yet. And she, he comes and tells God, please, Jesus, you have to heal my daughter. She is the only child that this man has. She is the only thing that he has going on. And this man is not some regular guy. A synagogue leader is somebody who has a great devotion to Jesus. He is somebody that probably goes to church every Sunday. He's somebody that has a lot of money. He has a lot of prominence. But then he still comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I need your help. I can't do this anymore. My daughter is dying. And if you read a couple of verses over, you see that this same this synagogue leader, his friends, the Pharisees, they were actually questioning Jesus about what he's doing. They were questioning what he is doing, but this man has enough faith, enough faith to say, Lord, I need your help. When calamity hit his doorstep, he said, Jesus, I need your help. And the moment Jesus heard this man, he got up with his disciples, and he was over going to his house. And Jesus wasn't only by himself. He wasn't walking alone. He had a crowd of people around him. A whole lot of people were just basically walking with him. On his way to this man's house, he had an encounter with the woman with the issue of blood. An issue of blood for the last 12 years. Let me ask you, how many men, no, no, never mind. How many women can imagine what it means to have a period for 12 years? 12 years, okay? Now, now think back 2,000 years back and think 12 years with a period without sanitary pads. Can you just imagine every single day this woman was going through this excruciating pain? It's a very long time to be in a period. But then it's not even about the period alone. You have to think about the context in which this woman is living. She's living under the Mosaic law. And if you look in Leviticus chapter 15, I'll read to you what it actually says about people in menstrual period. When you look on the screen, Leviticus 15, verse 19 says, When a woman has a discharge, if a discharge in her body is blood, she shall continue in a menstrual impurity for seven days. Whoever touches her shall be unclean until morning. Everything also on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean. Everything that she sits will be unclean. Anyone who touches her will be unclean. Whoever touches anything that has to do with her will be unclean. Whether it be on the bed or anything at all, she is unclean. You do not touch this woman. She is unclean. So she's having a period. She's isolated. She has no friends. And then secondly... If you look at the other version, it actually says that at the hands of doctors, she suffered many treatments. So even the process of this thing that she's going through, she had pain through the process of the other treatment that didn't work. And not only that, she has spent all that she had because of this. So basically, this woman is alone. She's going through an impurity process, and then she's broke and homeless. A lot like that woman, a lot like the woman I probably saw on the street this past week. A homeless woman was who God sat and spoke to. Someone you, you and I would have passed on the street without even saying a word to her. She was the kind of woman Jesus paused to take a look at. Mark chapter 5 verse 30 says, At once Jesus realized that power had left him. He turned around and said, Who was this woman that was touching me? So everybody was touching Jesus. Everybody was around him because he was in a crowd. But this particular woman stopped Jesus and said, wait, 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 something left me. She was the one that drew power from Jesus. Everyone was pressing. Remember that. Everyone comes to church. Everyone confesses they're Christian, but not everyone really truly act like one. The Greek word for the word power in this chapter is the word dunamis 
which was the first time we see this in the book of Mark. And what do you, what do you think dunamis mean? In our English word, it means dynamite. So just imagine Jesus is walking and a dynamite kind of power was pulled from a homeless woman. Can you just imagine what she did? Are you leaning into that kind of power? Do you trust Jesus the same way this woman trusts Jesus? He felt this power leave her. But at the same time, Jesus did not just pause there. What Jesus does is says, where are you? Who are you? He pulls her out of obscurity. He pulls her out of being unknown. Because everybody there, does, they don't want to see her. She's the unclean person. They, Jesus said, no, you know what? No, no, no. You're not going to hide behind the crowd. You are going to come out and tell me your testimony. And guess what? We're still talking about her today. So God has a reason and a purpose for everything. But as we're talking about this, let's not forget Jairus. Jairus was the same guy who finally got his attention. He finally said, Jesus, please come. Come and save my daughter. I need your help. I, please come. And this woman, I mean, she's been bleeding for 12 years. This girl is dying. If you were in an ER situation, which one would you go to first? The dying patient? Or are you going to go to the one that's, you know, bleeding for 12 years? You could handle another day. No, 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 no. Jesus stops. He pauses for her. He talks to her. Jesus is patient, and he is patient through everything. And from what we can see, you cannot rush Jesus. You cannot rush him. If you will remember anything at all today, remember this. God is always on time. No matter what you're going through in this world, he is always on time he knows, he sees, he knows, he sees, be patient. The master of the universe, the triune God, Jesus, Father, Holy Spirit, they are sovereign. He is the alpha, he is the omega, he is the beginning, he is the end, he is the creator of time in which time cannot define. So when he says he's coming, when he says he's going to be there, he's going to be there. You know, this past week, um, my sister had a wonderful blessing happen to her. And between me and her, if we grew up together, if we were around us growing up, she was more the motherly type. I was the one that uh, I did not know how to change a diaper until I had one of my own. So when it comes to my sister, she's the one that knows how to do everything. And it was time for her to start planning a family and it wasn't working quite the way we had planned. We're both doctors, we all know how this works, but it just wasn't working the way we thought it was gonna work. And when we saw and we heard what the doctor was saying, the other doctors were saying, it almost seemed impossible. But God is so good. There were times when I would call her and I would be crying on the way to work because I'll think about a situation, I just could not imagine that for her. And I had this song by Maverick City. It's called The Story I'll Tell. And I'll sing the song and I'll send it to her. And she'll be like, yes, girl, me too. Yes, I heard that song, you know. And we would just talk about it. You know what? God is so faithful. He's going to do it. He's going to bring it together. Well, after 600 plus days, last week, she gave birth to not one but two. Because God made time. And when he came, he didn't come just once. He came twice. God is so good. He is so good, and he's always on time because her story now is just so beautiful. I couldn't tell that story. I couldn't tell it. He is always on time. It is easy for you to think that this woman, this woman that Jesus stopped for, why? He should have rushed to Jairus' house and saved that little girl. She's done it all, but Jesus cares about her. She was also a daughter of the king. Even though she was homeless, she was still a daughter of the king. He sees you, and Jesus saw her and healed her that day. It was her time. It may seem like whatever you're going through is too difficult to fix. Or the person that's looking at you and thinking that your life is done with, you're almost 30, you're almost 40, you're not married yet, your friends are having babies, people are building businesses and everything else, but you have not even finished school yet. Ephesians 5, 1 says, imitate Christ. In this situation, I want you to be patient like Christ. 
act patient, believing that he will do what he says he's going to do in your life when he's going to do it. He wants more for you than you want for yourself. So no matter the dream that you have for yourself, if you trust in Jesus, his dream for you, it far outweighs whatever you could ever imagine. When I think about my life and the quote-unquote dreams that I had, where I'm living pales in comparison. So if you can trust him, he's going to be there for you. But don't make the mistake of leaning into Jesus, though, and think, oh, you know, it's an ATM machine. I pray five times a day. I do this. I do that. And I'll definitely get this. He doesn't work for you. He doesn't work for me. He doesn't work for any one of us. He, don't, he does not work for any one of us. But you can trust him, though. You can trust him 100% that he will come through. This woman was attended to at her time. God is attending to you now, even though you don't feel it. He's covering you and he's loving you. It took this woman out of obscurity and says, not just healing her, he healed her completely, pulls her out of obscurity. And 2,000 years later, we're still talking about her, the story she tells. So do not give up on Jesus. And after all that, she, that Jesus has done to this woman, he goes to Jairus' house. And now, after all this healing that Jesus has done, Jairus is like, well, there's no time for me now. My daughter is dead. And everybody came to him and told him, your daughter is dead. Don't even bother the master. It's done. Don't worry about it. There are people that will come into your life and tell you, don't worry. Just give up. There's no point. You're too old. Or, you know, this and that. Don't do this. But guess what? Jesus tells them, and he tells Jairus first. He tells them, be patient. Have faith. That same woman had enough faith. You can do the same. Jesus walks in and tells the people, you know, so in those times they actually hire people to cry for you. So they're mourners. So they already were in the house. They were yelling. They were screaming and saying, oh, God, this child is dead. There's nothing we can do. And just said, please, 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 stop talking. Just, just move out of the way. And he tells them she is not dead. She's sleeping. Jesus is not denying the obvious he is challenging us to see his power. Jesus faces the biggest obstacle of our lives. The biggest obstacle to all mankind. The worst thing that will ever happen to you and to the one you love. The biggest obstacle, which is death. What happens next is a foreshadow of what will happen to Jesus and to those that trust him. He goes into the room with her parents and the disciples, and he goes into this room, and he holds the little girl's hand and says a word that we see in other version. It says Talitha. And you could read that and just pass it over, but Talitha is actually a word that's very tender, very endearing. It's kind of like saying honey or a sweetheart. And he says, Talitha, come, arise. He didn't shake her. He didn't do like the sternal rub to kind of make sure she's awake. No, he didn't do all that. He just said, arise. And that was it. He whispers into her ear. And all along, as if she was just sleeping. Imagine a child sleeping and just kind of tuck them open to just open their eyes. This one huge looming darkness that all of us will one day have to face. Jesus has the power over death. His power is even so much greater and his love so beautiful that Jesus is the one, like the unclean woman, took on our iniquity. He became unclean on our behalf so that we can be made clean. He's the one who actually dies, buried and rises on the third day so that the stink of death will not have an immortal effect on us. At the feet of Jesus, like Jairus, we can fall to our knees. Like my guy, the homeless guy that we saw last week. We could raise our arms to Jesus and trust him. You cannot be patient in whatever crisis you have in your life if you do not believe or trust in him. He is the object of our faith. You know, people always say, you know, I have blind faith. No, no, I don't like blind faith. I want a faith I can see and I know Jesus. He is the object of our faith. He's whom we trust in. When the tough time comes, and I, let me tell you, it will surely come, all of us will go through a difficult time. It's in, inevitable. But you fix your eyes on Jesus. Stand firm on his word 
And even if it looks like life is passing you by, remember that you are firmly placed on the rock of ages. He's not moving. When your friends are getting married, guess what? You better go there, buy them gift, dance in with them. When they're having babies, throw them a baby shower. And it's not because you're telling God, I got a receipt here, Lord. You know, I've done all of this. You know, don't, don't forget me. Oh, no, 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 no. What you are doing is actually telling the devil and your enemies, my father is coming. I am acting in faith because I know he will never, ever let me down. Romans 8.32 also says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over to all of us. How will he not also him freely give all things? You see, Jesus is always calling us. He's running after us, taking his time with you and with me. He looks at the woman with the issue of blood and says, daughter, your healing is complete because you have faith in me. Nothing, and I mean nothing, no one can ever satisfy you like Jesus does. And I'm repeating that, nothing. I don't care how beautiful your child is how wonderful your husband is, how great your job is, how much money you have in your bank account, absolutely nothing. Because I know people that are very rich that are yet still poor in hearts, that have a lot of money, they drive the best cars, but they're miserable. Nothing will ever fulfill you the way Jesus does. I love this quote by, uh, by St. Bernard. He's a monk in the 11th century, and I, I like history. A thousand years ago, he said something. He said, the name of Jesus is not only light, but also food. It is also oil without which all food of the soul is dry. It is salt without whose seasoning, whatever is set before us is insipid. Finally, it is honey in the mouth, melody in the ear, rejoicing in the heart, and at the same time, medicine is everything. Jesus is the ultimate reward. It's not that thing Jesus himself is the ultimate reward. Will you be patient with him? Can you trust him? Can you lift up your hands in total abandon and just grasp the tassel of his majesty? He is offering you the only remedy to mankind's greatest tragedy, himself. He has paid the ultimate price. He has died the death that we deserve so that we can live a life that he deserved. Just let that sink in. We deserve what we get. Let no man ever tell you I'm a good person. None of us are. He is the only good one. And he took on all our sins, all our iniquities on himself on that cross. And he dies for you and he dies for me so that eternity we will not be split away from God. He is the ultimate uh, reward. He died the death that we deserve so we can live like a king. So when God sees you, he doesn't see your imperfections. He doesn't see your scars. He doesn't see the bad things you've done. He sees Jesus. Look around you. We were just praying today about Ukraine. I guess in the next couple of months, be something else. It's always something else. We have failed woefully on our own. When we chose in the garden to go ahead and live our own way, live our own truth, We are definitely living our own truth right now, and we can see it. It isn't working. Jesus is extending his hands to you. Take a hold of it. Let the Holy Spirit come into your heart. Ask Jesus to create in you a clean heart today and to renew the right spirit within you. He is chasing after you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we give you all the glory. We know that we are imperfect. We know that we are sinful people. We know that we don't have it right. And like the woman with the issue of blood... We are at your feet today, Jesus, crying, hoping, wishing that you will heal us. I know there's somebody in here today who is going through a difficult time. I know there's somewhere here today 
who's going through a time of pain and wishing and hoping. Father, I just pray that you speak to their hearts. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that you care about them. If you're in this room today and you want to get to know Jesus, we are down here wanting to pray with you. If you want to get to know him, if you want a new life, if you want a new beginning, if you're asking and you see that your life isn't getting better and you're anxious all the time, you're depressed, you're having a really difficult time, come down, let us pray with you. We have a prayer team here available to pray with you. You don't have to take this alone. You don't have to bear this pain alone. We are all here in this community with you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity today to talk to you. The opportunity, O Lord God, today to hear your voice in your word, through your miracles. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration. We thank you, Lord, because you are good, good, good Father. In Jesus' name.